Jacinto Aquili was a peacemaking Dominican priest who didn't like the Inquisition that his order ran. He was befriended by his old teacher, who had now been a Jesuit priest for 15 years. During their conversations in 1833, Jacinto got way more than he bargained for. Along with learning about the Jesuits' work worldwide on a general basis, and about their efforts in Italy, he also got some important hints about what the Jesuits' plans were for England. Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. Jacinto's former instructor, now a Jesuit, wistfully spoke of where he would like to work. I'll give you excerpts of what he said. Quote, Generally, those who are sent into foreign countries are not allowed to return until they've signalized themselves in some praiseworthy manner. It is considered a great favor to be called to Rome, as it is also a heavy punishment to be banished from it. For my own part, I have many times requested to be sent to some foreign country, but I never could obtain my wish. To tell the truth, I should much prefer a mission to England. I differ from my brethren in that respect. Although a Roman, the air of Rome, and more particularly of the Vatican, is too heavy for my liking. My old friends have told me about how they could literally feel this thickness of evil spiritual forces in the air around the Vatican. Back to Jacinto. But tell me, I asked, what do the Jesuits do out of Italy? In France, for example, or in England? I do not suppose they employ themselves in the duty of education, the principal object of their foundation. For my part, I could never understand what business they could have, either in England or in the United States. Still, replied he, there are many in both those countries, and many more will follow. It is our desire and our hope to obtain the same influence in England that we have in Italy. Protestantism in that country already inclines greatly towards Catholicism, and will do so still more in proportion as the Jesuits gain ground there. Then Jacinto's Jesuit friend told him how Jesuits work in England. Our success is much impeded by other priests and monks who in their ignorant fanaticism imprudently attack the Protestants and thus only strengthen their opposition to the Church of Rome. Here's the difference between a Jesuit and other Catholic priests. We, on the other hand, have the art of introducing ourselves among them without exciting attention, consequently without creating suspicion or alarm. Apparently occupied with our own affairs, we appear to take no notice of other people. We readily associate with them, sit at their tables, and converse on general topics. We never oppose or contradict what they may advance. Do they talk of the Bible? We are ready to talk on the same subject. We always, however, have some strong arguments in reserve, for which most of them are not prepared. Scholastic doctrines, which the Bible does not disavow, which are received with great willingness. Jesuits do not attack. They infiltrate. They seem to agree, since they don't oppose us, yet they always have a store of arguments that take our breath away, or that sound so good, we start to question our own beliefs and find ourselves pulled in to agree with them. This happened to me at the Christian Light bookstore 
back in 1980. I'll read it from my book, Why They Changed the Bible, One World Bible for One World Religion. Compromise only goes one way. Three months after I returned to the Lord in 1980, I went to my local Christian light bookstore that used to be in the center of town. That day, standing at the end of the aisle, in the furthest corner of the bookstore was clearly a Catholic priest. He was a young man in his traditional black outfit. I walked over to him, intrigued at his Catholicism, and began to talk with him about Christ. During the short talk, he said, we must be willing to compromise on some things for fellowship between me and him. Somehow his next words carried me along like a song. I thought we were both coming to agreement on some doctrines and all seemed sweet and rosy and agreeable. And then I walked out of the bookstore and got on my motorcycle. The bracing, cool fall air suddenly woke me up. I knew I'd been hoodwinked. But I didn't know how or why I had been so agreeable all of a sudden. I strapped on my helmet and started my bike. Lord, what just happened in there? It's the strangest feeling when you know you've been had. You feel like you've been violated and yet nothing physical was taken. But he played on my conscience. My want for fellowship and the false assumption that we needed to agree about anything. I directed my thoughts straight at my Heavenly Father as I started toward the setting sun down Hold Avenue. What I realized as I prayed and rode home was this. Compromise with a Roman Catholic only goes one way. They never compromise. They only make you think they did while you do all the compromising. I later learned a Roman Catholic motto, Semper Eadem, always the same. No matter what they look like, nothing ever changes. Back to Jacinto's Jesuit friend. Jacinto narrates. Observe now, he continued, our method of proceeding in England. We get acquainted with the Episcopalians, Anglicans, the Church of England. Our time would be lost with the others, and while we praise their doctrines, we endeavor to show how near they are to our own. He then went into great detail about Anglican church beliefs and their similarities to Catholic beliefs and practices. Then he said, but it is very different with the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Independents, and others of a similar class. We cannot deceive them into a belief that their opinions approximate to ours. Everything regarding papacy they hold in such abhorrence that, as they express it, they would rather enter into a league with the Archfiend himself than with us. How then do we proceed with them? Our efforts are directed to sow enmity between them and the Episcopalians. And from this, we derive a double advantage. They cease to trouble themselves respecting us and endeavor to annoy their adversaries. Thus, from their mutual discord, we gain an increase of power. The plan is worthy of the Jesuits, I replied, but do you think it will succeed? Will they not ultimately become aware of your intentions? And may it not happen that all parties, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Baptists, dissenters, and others, may unite and direct their hostilities against yourselves? In that case, our mission would terminate, and it would no longer be possible for our church to maintain its establishments in that country. We must, to use the common phrase, shut up shop. But such a union is impossible. You might sooner expect the dog to be in friendship with a cat, the wolf and the lamb to feed together, or the fox and the goose to share the same repast, and than that these different sects should harmonize together. 
But this wasn't the only Jesuit to talk about casting his eyes on England. That brings me to another man who wasn't a Jesuit, yet he was counted as one. His name was Luigi. Luigi Francesco di Santis, who is privy to a lot of priests' private information. Here's his own self-summary. Sometimes an author in his introduction wrote about himself as if he were another person. That's called third-person writing. Quote, He is by birth a Roman and lived for two and twenty years in a community of priests affiliated by the Jesuits, with whom he was on the most friendly terms. For fifteen years he filled the office of confessor, and for eight years was the priest of one of the principal parishes of Rome. He stood high in the estimation of his ecclesiastical superiors, and was consequently entrusted with many secrets and missions of considerable delicacy. First, Luigi lived for twenty-two years with priests affiliated with the Jesuits. Second, he became friendly with them. Third, he listened to confessions for 15 of those years. Fourth, for eight years, he was a priest in one of the main churches in Rome. Fifth, he was so esteemed that he was entrusted with secrets. Sixth, he had to take care of very delicate issues among those priests. He, Luigi, was the select preacher or confessor of almost all the monasteries in Rome. As the professor of theology, the censor of the theological academy in the Roman University, and an associate in many other academies, he was frequently consulted. Cardinal Micara, dean of the Sacred College, and a man in universal repute, selected him as his clerical examiner. He is therefore better qualified than the vast majority to represent popery as it is. Luigi was a highly educated, sought-after, zealous Catholic. Priests, monks, and professors trusted and confided in him. He spent three years learning the Jesuits' exercises of St. Ignatius to grasp the deeper meaning of the Jesuit experience. In fact, he learned it so well that he got the attention of the Jesuit general, Jan Philippe Rotan, who gave him his own special treatise on the exercises. Quote, A work which I do not reserve, said he, for the cardinals alone, but put into your hands also, since you are truly one of us. End quote. Remember Rotan? That was the same Jesuit priest that Jacopo Leone spoke to and later heard secretly when Jacopo was training to be a Jesuit back in September of 1824. Five years later, in 1829, Ruotan became the next superior general, which position he held until 1853. It's a pretty big thing when the Jesuit superior general says, you are truly one of us. Luigi was one of the few non-Jesuits admitted to the inside world of the Society of Jesus. Luigi continued, In explanation of his acquaintance with the Inquisition, the author may state that for ten years he occupied the post of examiner, or theological censor, to the Holy Office. Nothing was kept secret from him. He visited the prisons frequently, received the denunciations, and other times heard the culprit's spontaneous confessions, and whole trials have been referred to his decision. What he has said of the Inquisition has been said from his own knowledge, and not on the authority of others. Luigi was talking about hearing the confessions of people who were imprisoned by the Inquisition, and accused of crimes they likely didn't commit. But what was coming next was torture, so they usually confessed to just about anything. So Luigi truly saw the darker side to the Jesuits and other priests' dirty work. Such a man was Luigi Francesco de Sanctis. You couldn't fool him about what priests did in secret. 
you couldn't pull the wool over his eyes about how the Inquisition ran. He knew it all. And the Jesuits especially liked him, and they told him their secrets. When he finally left the Catholic religion, just like Alberto Rivera, he desperately wanted the Christians to know what really went on in the Catholic system and what was in store for them if the Catholics ever regained power. In 1852, De Sanctis published his book, Popery and Jesuitism at Rome in the 19th Century, with remarks on their influence in England in 20 letters. In short, he created fictional characters in order to tell about the historical fact. That's the same thing that Chick Publications does with the Crusader comic series. In this form, Luigi ultimately exposed the Jesuit order, showing how the Jesuit gradually became disillusioned with Jesuitism and Roman Catholicism, ultimately coming to faith in Christ. When you read his book, it looks like letters from Henri, a young Genovese Roman Catholic studying divinity in a Jesuit seminary in Rome, to his friend Eugene, a young Protestant in Geneva. With that background, Listen to what Luigi revealed about the Jesuits' purpose in England through the character Henri. Despite all the persecution they, the Jesuits, have met with, they have not abandoned England, where there are a greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. That there are Jesuits in all classes of society, in Parliament, among the English clergy, among the Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. I could not comprehend how a Jesuit could be a Protestant priest or how a Protestant priest could be a Jesuit. But my confessor share, silenced my scruples by telling me, Omnia munda mundis. All things are pure to the pure. And that St. Paul became as a Jew that he might save the Jews. It was no wonder, therefore, if a Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant for the conversion of the Protestants. In other words, Jesuits pretend to be Christians, like a spy among his enemies. That is not what Paul talked about. Being respectful to people in different religions was completely different from deceitfully pretending to be of a different religion. The English clergy were formerly too much attached to their articles of faith to be shaken from them, and so the Jesuits of England tried another plan. The Church of England was created based upon 39 articles of faith. The Jesuits decided they wouldn't attack them. Instead, they did this, quote, To demonstrate from history and ecclesiastical antiquity, the legitimacy of the usages of the English church, whence, through the exertions of the Jesuits, concealed among its clergy, might arise a studious attention to Christian antiquity. In other words, undercover Jesuits got the Anglicans to debate about the so-called church fathers in trying to see if they were following historical Christianity or not. Luigi continued, this was designed to occupy the clergy in long, laborious, and abstruse investigation and to alienate them from their Bibles. How did the Jesuits plan to turn England back to Rome? By getting the Christians so distracted about what early church writers thought and what it means that they totally forget about using and trusting their Bibles. Question, how do you destroy the people of the book? Answer, by getting the people away from the book. The Jesuits didn't mind joining with Protestants and Baptists. They didn't mind letting Christians do most of the talking, but when they could, they would find doctrines that divide and let Christians fight among themselves. So they would turn their focus from the scriptures and from their true enemy, the Roman whore of Babylon. 
Jesuits were glad to use any diversion that would keep Christians from focusing on the holy words of God in English, the King James Bible. Next, I'll show you some of the connections between the Jesuit order and the Protestant Bible societies from about 1805 to the present. Until then, God bless you and have a wonderful day.